I, I recently learned about an artist named Phil Hansen. Phil Hansen is a huge success. Uh, his breakthrough work of art is online, and it's been viewed over two million times. Uh, Hansen is so successful, he was chosen to be the official artist for the 2009 Grammys. I did not even know that the Grammys had an official artist, but he is. And uh, Phil Hansen gave a TED Talk. But what kind of artist gives a TED Talk? Well, Phil Hansen does, and it's been viewed online almost two million times. And I think we love to hear a story like that. We love it because we love strength. We love success, right? When there's a team that might go undefeated or set a record for wins, we love that. We live in a culture that celebrates strength. In 2007, a business book came out called Strengths Finder. Uh, when you bought the book, it gave you a little code where you can go online, take an assessment, and learn your five greatest strengths. Uh, the book was wildly successful. Of course it was. We all want to learn our strengths, right? If the book was called Weaknesses Finder, I don't think it would ever go out of stock on Amazon. No one wants to learn about their weaknesses. We love strengths. We, we revel in our strengths, and uh, no one likes to acknowledge their weaknesses. Right? You, you see this in job interviews where uh, the person says, and so tell me, what, what would you say is your greatest weakness? Does anyone ever say an actual weakness? No, never, right? What, what we do is we say a strength cleverly disguised as a weak. We, uh, like, like no one ever says, no one ever says, uh, honestly, I have no attention to detail. Like I am going to repeatedly let you down, right? Never say that. You, you never say, I have horrible people skills. Like I turn people off. Every customer is going to not like, no one says that. What we do is we, we say a strength disguised as a weakness. We'll say, well... I am a bit of a workaholic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the first one into the office, the last one to leave. It's just, that's just a, a burden I've had to bear. Like, it's just me. Or, or we say, you know, I, di I just care too much about getting things done. You know, like, like, if I see something that needs to be done, I just have this burden of responsibility where I'm going to do it. It's been a struggle my whole life, right? We, we, we love our strengths, and we don't like to acknowledge our weaknesses. Another place we see this is on social media, where we put up pictures and descriptions of our day's activities and of our family and, and our kids that make us seem very successful and very important. There's a new form of doing this that people call humble brag, the humble brag. It's where um, you, you want to put something on social media that will allow everyone to see just how awesome you and your family are, but you don't want to appear prideful, and so you do the humble brag. Like you might put on Facebook, it is so hard getting Ethan out of the door to go to school on time. That boy, all he wants to do is practice cello, right? It's like, it looks like you're appearing to be like a real problem and you're humble about it, but then you realize, oh, you're trying to tell us that your kid's a, a child prodigy, a musical prodigy, right? Or another humble brag might be, uh, uh, man, gas prices are so high, it's killing me. I can't believe how much it costs to fill up my new BMW, right? Oh, I'm so sorry you've been cursed with a $90,000 car. So hard. We, we celebrate strengths, and, and we prefer not to acknowledge our weaknesses, and that is a real problem. That is a real problem because we are only able to receive God's grace to the extent that we're able to recognize our need for it. We're in a, a new series that started last week in which we're talking about God's grace. And grace is it's receiving God's blessing. It's receiving God's help. It's, it's experiencing receiving God's presence when you need it, but don't deserve it. Maybe even deserve the, the very opposite of that. And, and what we're learning is that grace is a total game changer. Experiencing grace, living in grace, it just turns your life upside down in the very best of ways. And, and so we need to receive God's grace. And that's why uh, moments that happen in life where you realize that you are not that strong, when, when uh, we become aware of our weaknesses, are so important. They're so critical. Now, when, when that happens, it feels painful, right? Uh, maybe you've had a, a moment in your life where you realize, oh man, I am not as strong as I, I like to think I am. Or, or, wow, I didn't know it, but I have a real weakness there. And, and if you haven't had moments like that, they're coming, okay? You're going to. And, and when they do, they, they feel 
painful. What's interesting, though, is that, that the truth is that that moment may feel like it's full of pain, but it's also full of power. Those are the most powerful moments but because we are only able to receive God's grace to the extent that we're able to recognize our need for it. And, and what we learn in those moments is that when we don't have what it takes, man, he has everything we need. See, we live in a culture that, that celebrates grace and condemns weakness, but what grace does is it, it enables us to celebrate weakness. And, and when we celebrate weakness, it, it opens the floodgates uh, uh, for grace to pour into our lives. And when grace pours into our lives, it allows us to celebrate our weaknesses all the more. And, and so it kind of becomes a, a, a circle, a beautiful circle. We see this beautiful circle in the life of a guy in the Bible named Paul. Uh, in uh, the book, in the Bible, we have two letters that Paul, we have a bunch of letters that Paul wrote, but two letters that Paul wrote to a, a church in the city of Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a city back then that was celebrated for its strength. It was known for its luxurious lifestyles and its impressive architecture and its elite socialites. It was like a destination city, the kind of place you hoped to visit. It was a place you went to for, for pleasure and, and to experience exotic lifestyles and to see impressive architecture and buildings. And uh, there was actually the Corinthian style of architecture, which was characterized by columns with amazing detail that were constructed to portray power. It was a city all about power. And so uh, after Paul wrote his first letter to these Christian Corinthians, uh, some false teachers had come into the city and they were winning people over to their wrong way of thinking by their boasting about uh, their, their kind of their religious resumes and the amazing spiritual experiences that they had had. And, and so Paul wants the, the Corinthians to know how false and wrong these teachers are. And he wants to teach the Corinthians to celebrate not their strengths, but their weaknesses. But Paul knows that, unfortunately, the only way he's going to get them to listen to him, to talk about weakness, is if they first know his strengths. And so he has to start there. And so we're going to look at some verses from this letter, a bunch of them. And if you, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you today, you can look up on the screen. We're going to put all the verses up there. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you one today. We've got Bibles at our Velcro bar, which is our connecting place. And so on your way out today, you can grab a Bible. If you'd like to meet somebody, there'll be friendly people back there to meet. If you don't want to meet anybody, you can just grab a Bible. So uh, check out how Paul begins in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 21. He says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. And so he starts out by saying, hey, I've got all the same credentials as these people that you're following. And then he continues, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell him about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. But whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. So Paul reluctantly tells about this special vision he had, uh, the special revelation when he was caught up to what he calls the third heaven. And I don't know exactly what that means as far as being in heaven, but it happened 14 years prior and he's never mentioned it. And even now that he does mention it, he refuses to go into any detail. Uh, we, we looked at this passage back in March in a series, a different context, a series we did on heaven. And I admitted to you, and I will admit again, that if I was caught up to the third heaven, I would not wait 14 years to mention it. Like, I would immediately be tweeting, what'd you all do today? I was visiting the third heaven. I mean, that, that's it, really, no big deal. I would work it into every conversation. But like, no matter what we were talking about, I would, I would begin always the same way. Well, you know... When I was caught up to the third heaven, 
Yeah, I, I would. Uh, my next book would be called The Third Heaven, Why God Chose Me and Not You. I guarantee it. Th there would be a movie made about me called Third Heaven, the Vince Antonucci story, starring Channing Tatum as me, Natch. <laughs> It would immediately get like top billing in my bio. Like if I ever speak somewhere, they would say, our speaker today comes from Las Vegas, Nevada, by way of the third heaven. Right? I would. But it's been 14 years and Paul has never said a word about it. And it's because he was not one to celebrate his strength. That's what we do. It's not what Paul did. And, and he only mentions it here because he's trying to teach these Corinthians that what we need to learn is to celebrate our weakness. So in, in verses 6 and 7, he uh, kind of explains his uh, accomplishments and experiences and how they could have led him to celebrate his strengths, right? When, when you have some success, it's easy to celebrate your strengths and, and to put confidence in himself. But then check out how he continues in verse uh, 7. He writes, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. So what exactly was Paul's uh, thorn in the flesh? We don't know. There, there's a lot of speculation and we're actually going to take a few guesses here in a minute. But I wonder if maybe he doesn't say what it is so that it would be easier for us to fill in the blank. You know, if he told us, maybe we wouldn't be able to relate to it. But, but by not saying what it is, we can all kind of fill in the blank with our own thorn in the flesh. And so, what would yours be? What would yours be? What is that thing in your life, maybe things, that, that you have begged God to take away from your life, to, to heal in your life? What is it in life that forces you to acknowledge that you have weaknesses. Look at how Paul, so uh, how God responds to Paul's begging. So Paul's been begging, God, please take this away. Ready? Each time he, God, each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Grace uh, enables Paul to, to celebrate his weaknesses. Uh, celebrating his weakness kind of opened up the floodgates for, for grace to pour into his life. When grace poured into his life, it allowed him to acknowledge his weaknesses all the more, which allowed more grace to pour in his life, and it became this beautiful circle. Pa Paul realized that he was only able to receive God's grace to the extent that he was able to recognize his need for it, that, that when he didn't have what it took, it turned out God had everything he needed. He also discovered that God's grace gave him great power. Admitting weakness forced him to, to lean into God, and so it gave him strength beyond his own. And we learn from Paul that grace is greater than. It's greater than your weakness. It's like in our weakness, God shows us his grace by demonstrating his power in our lives. And so Paul says uh, that the experience of that led him to take pleasure in his weakness. He, he became more excited when he detected weaknesses in his life than when he detected strengths in his life because in his weakness, he was forced to, to rely on God and it gave God all kinds of room to come in and, and to show up and to show off. And, and listen, whatever you filled in the blank with, whatever your thorn is, God's grace is greater than that. So, so let's dig a little deeper into how this works and what Paul's thorn might have been and how we can learn from Paul about this. So uh, like one thing we learned from Paul is that grace is greater than our infirmities. Grace is greater than our infirmities. So there are some hints in the Bible that Paul uh, probably wasn't the best looking guy. We, we might say he didn't have the the, the Vince kind of animal magnetism, se sexy. He probably didn't have this. Um, 
Uh, we also get a lot of hints that he probably had terrible vision. He may, may have had a real uh, eyesight problem. And possibly, some people believe, maybe epilepsy. If Paul's thorn was an infirmity, well, Paul discovered that God's grace was, was greater and that he could experience God's strength in his weakness. So I, I mentioned uh, that guy, Phil Hansen, uh, the, this incredible artist, uh, unbelievably successful. I neglected to mention that Phil Hansen is handicapped. He, he didn't grow up that way. Uh, he went to art school, and he was a, had a promising art career. Uh, and in art school, he began to develop a shake in his hand. He had spent years working to become an expert in pointillism. Pointillism is a kind of art where you draw perfect little circles to create a bigger image. And years of, of making tiny dots led to permanent nerve damage in his hand. And so suddenly, Phil's signature ability to make perfect small circles became his signature disability. His strength suddenly was a weakness. And so he did what we would do. He quit. He quit art school. He quit art. But then later, uh, words that his neurologist had spoken stuck with him and, and started to make him think. His neurologist had said, Phil, why don't you just embrace the shake? Why don't you just embrace the shake? So Phil started experimenting with art where his shake wouldn't negatively affect his work and, and might even serve to help him create better art. And, and experiencing this new limitation led Phil to look for other ways that he might use weakness to, to jumpstart his creativity. He asked questions like, what if, and just thinking about different limitations he might face, what if you could only use a dollar's worth of supplies to create art? What if you had to paint a painting but could not use a a paintbrush. But what if you had to make art not to display to other people, but to destroy? What if you uh, had to rely on other people's creativity to create your content? Like, what limitations can I intentionally force on myself? And it led, and we'll show you some pictures, to some really cool and unique art. Uh, I would encourage you, watch his TED Talk. It's awesome, and you will see his art in action. You'll hear the stories behind these pictures. They're wild stories. It, it was creating art based on weakness that led to all of Phil Hansen's success, and he's one of the most successful artists in America today. Phil Hansen's conclusion was that we need to first become limited in order to become limitless. We need to be limited to become limitless. There's a woman, some of you may have heard of, Joni Erickson Tata. She learned a similar lesson. So as a teenager, she became a quadriplegic in a diving accident. Since then, she's become a very popular Christian writer. I love the story she tells in one of her books. Uh, she writes this. Honesty is always the best policy but especially when you're surrounded by a crowd of women in a restroom during a break at a Christian women's conference. Something I don't know about. <laughs> uh, she writes, one woman putting on lipstick said, Oh, Joni, you always look so together, so happy in your wheelchair. I wish I had your joy. Several women around her nodded. How do you do it? She asked as she capped her lipstick. I don't do it. I said. In fact, may I tell you honestly how I woke up this morning? This is an average day. I breathe deeply. After my husband, Ken, leaves for work at 6 a.m., I'm alone until I hear the front door open at 7 a.m. That's when a friend arrives to get me up. While I listen to her make coffee, I pray, oh Lord, my friend will soon give me a bath, get me dressed, sit me up in my chair, brush my hair and teeth, and send me out the door. I don't have the strength to face, this, to face this routine one more time. I have no resources. I don't have a smile to take into the day. But you do. May I have yours. God, I need you so desperately. So what happens when your friend comes through the bedroom door? One of the ladies asked. I turn my head toward her and give her a smile sent straight from heaven. It's not mine, it's God's. And so, I said, gesturing to my paralyzed legs, whatever joy you see today, 
was hard won this morning. I have learned that the weaker we are, the more we need to lean on God. And the more we lean on God, the stronger we discover him to be. I wonder if maybe you have some infirmities that you have begged God to take away from you and for reasons you can't explain, he hasn't. Maybe it's a physical challenge, something you don't like about your appearance or your personality. Maybe it's a temptation that won't go away. And I wonder if you took a closer look at that thing you've been begging God to take away, if you'd realize that it's forced you to lean on God and it can become one of your greatest strengths. Next year in the spring, we're going to be starting a recovery ministry here at Verb. And so uh, it will be a, just a community of, of hope and healing for people who have struggled not only with addictions, uh, but whatever they can't get past in life. Maybe it's unforgiveness, just whatever it is. And um, this weekend, I, I was able to take a group of 14 people from Verb to Denver, where we got to experience a, a really cool recovery ministry and, and get some training on how we can lead a good ministry here. And it, it's so amazing, these 14 people, most all of them have had uh, in their past an addiction or something that they could not get past. And, and I'm sure like Paul, they begged, God, just take it away, take away the temptation. And God didn't. He, he didn't take away the temptation. And what that did is it forced them to lean into God and to learn principles of recovery. And so they've gotten past the, the struggle that they had, but now it's become a strength because they're able to share with other people what they learned about how to get past something you can't get past. And that's what God wants to do in your life as well. When we are weak, he is strong, and his grace is greater than our infirmities. Uh, we also learn from Paul that grace is greater than our inabilities. We don't know if it was his thorn in the flesh, but several times in different letters he wrote in the Bible, Paul mentions that he was not a very uh, eloquent or very persuasive speaker. He, he continually kind of puts down his speaking abilities. And in acknowledging that weakness, man, God, God's grace came crashing into his life in such a powerful way that he basically became the spokesperson for Christianity for its inception. He wrote about half of the New Testament. And what we learn is that when we are weak, when we are ready and, and willing to acknowledge our weakness, man, God is strong. Now, I, I think of uh, my, my introverted nature. Some of you may not guess this, but I am like a very much an introvert. Like being around too many people for too long is just very draining. And as a pastor, you often have to be around too many people for too long. And, and so I've worked with other pastors who are like fantastic in those settings and, and they're, they're energized by it. And I have envied them and been jealous of them. And I have prayed so many times, God, would you just, would you tweak my personality? Would, would you make me more extroverted? And he hasn't. But, but I lean on him and in those situations, I think I do okay. And, and I've realized that there are a lot of ways that that weakness of mine is one of my best strengths. For a lot of pastors, um, they become so consumed with ministering to people, because there's always people who need you, that it's really easy to neglect their relationship with God or their families. They, they don't mean to, but they just don't have time to spend with God or their families because they're always ministering to people. But because I'm an introvert, it forces me to pull away from people, and it's helped me to make God and my family the, the priorities they need to be. And, and again, I wonder about you. What inabilities have tormented you. Maybe you haven't been able to uh, overcome your procrastination or um, your need to always feel like you're in control. Maybe you haven't been able to get a job or uh, find the person that you want to marry or you haven't been able to stay married to the person that you thought you'd be with forever. Perhaps that's an area where God can come into your life and work through you and make it a, a strength of yours. I bet it is. I bet it is. When we're weak, he is strong, and his grace is greater than our inabilities. 
But one last, we also learned from Paul that, that grace is greater than our insecurities, than our insecurities. So Paul at times in his letters uh, expresses insecurities. In fact, in this same letter that we're looking at, 2 Corinthians, he talks about how he's faced so many different challenges in his ministry and, and uh, just the feelings of inadequacy that he's felt uh, to, to do what God has called him to do. And then he writes, um, he writes and who is equal to such a task? He, he's like, who, who has enough strength to do what God calls them to do? Certainly not me. And, and then he explains, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He's like a God who has resurrection power, and you don't need to feel insecure because you can find your security in a God who has power like that. You know, it's funny. I don't think of myself as being insecure. If you ask me, I'm like, no, that's not an issue I have. But I, I hate to be vulnerable. And I think that's insecurity. So I'm probably insecure. And I just don't, I like to pretend I'm not. That's probably insecurity right there. I'm a mess. And so, <laughs> but, but what, what I've discovered doing ministry now for 20 whatever years is like in relationships and speaking, if I'm vulnerable, that really helps people. And so I don't like it, but I've asked God, help me to be vulnerable. And I think, you, you be the judge, I, I think I'm very vulnerable. And so what's happened is my, my weakness became a strength. Instead of saying, I can do this, I'm like, God, I can't, but you could help me. And, and, and so you know, what, what, what I've learned is that when I humble myself and I acknowledge my weakness, grace comes running. Grace comes running. Do you have some insecurities? Maybe they, they prevent you from being vulnerable. Perhaps those insecurities are intended to, to force you to, to rely on God and to experience his resurrection power. When we are weak, he is strong, and we learn that his grace is greater than our insecurities. You know, we, we, we live in a culture that celebrates strength. We love strength, and, and I'm not sure that's ever going to change, right? We all want strength. We, we want strength. And so I, I, the question I want to leave you with today, the questions, where do you find strength, and how much strength do you really want? Where do you find strength? And how much strength do you want? And you can find it in your own store of willpower. But I'm, I'm guessing probably most of us have lived long enough to, to realize there's not as much strength in our own willpower as we need there to be. But you have a God who wants you to find strength in him, and you will find unlimited strength. To, to help you, he will reveal your weaknesses to you. And that might feel painful, but it's supposed to be a hint to, to, to hit you with the realization, I'm not strong enough. I thought I was, but I'm not strong enough. And, and so that you'll turn to him. And when you turn to him, when, when you don't have what it takes, you find that he has everything you need. Man, we see this all through the Bible. You, you may not know the stories, but you look at stories like Moses and Gideon and Elijah and the apostles and Paul. They were all completely intimidated by their calling. And God gives to each of them the same assurance. He says, I will be with you. I'll be with you. And so it's fine. It's totally fine that you don't have what it takes because I do. And I will be with you. So where do you find your strength? How much strength do you want? When you recognize your weakness and you turn to God, when, like Paul, you, you beg God, what you're going to find is his answer is, my grace is all you need. My grace is always sufficient. You will find that he has an endless supply of empowering grace. I want you to imagine something. If it helps you, you could close your eyes if that would help you to imagine this. It might. There, no one's going to come and pick your pocket. This isn't the time. It's like, oh, no. This is when they get me. That's not, not going to happen. So close your eyes or not. Your choice. Ready? Here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that you're standing in, in a place that feels kind of like the middle of nowhere. There's a big wall uh, made of rocks in front of you, but, but that's it. You're in the middle of nowhere, and you're holding a small, empty cup. We're, we're going to let the emptiness in that cup represent our weakness, and okay? that's your weakness. Now, you need the cup to be filled. You need it to be filled, and you notice a, a hose nearby. It's coming out of that 
big, long, high stone wall. You, you can't see what's on the other side of the wall, but there's a hose and a, and a spigot to, to turn it. And so you need your cup filled and you decide to give it a chance. What you discover is that the faucet works. And so you turn it on and water begins to emerge from the hose. It's not spraying, it, it's more of a, a trickle. And you hope that there's enough to fill your cup, but you're not sure. And, and what happens is the, the water goes up to the very rim of your cup and then it stops. It's odd. It's just new when to stop, it seems. And, but you're, you're very happy because your cup was filled and it worked out well. So just, just to make sure you get the symbolism, the, the water represents God's strength. Okay, well, time passes. And, and one day you have to come back, uh, but this time you, you arrive not with a cup, but with an empty bucket because you need a bucket worth. The, the bucket could symbolize maybe a health scare, in your life or a financial issue. You really need some strength. And so you bring with you a nice size bucket and you approach the hose and you turn it on hoping that it will work again. And it does. Water starts coming out, gradually filling up the bucket until it's exactly full and then it stops. How, how does it know when to stop? Well, time passes, and eventually you come back, but this time you come back pushing a wheelbarrow. Like your weakness, your need is greater than you've ever had before. Perhaps uh, you've lost your job, or your marriage is in a bad place, or uh, maybe you have a special needs child. So you turn on the hose, and you discover the plumbing still works. The, the water comes out with that familiar swish, and the wheelbarrow begins to slowly fill. And once again, the water stops when the wheelbarrow is completely full. And you sigh with relief. The next time you show up, you are driving a semi-truck, hauling a tank, a water tank, the size of a, like a trailer. And, and maybe that water tank represents uh, radiation treatments for cancer, or a business that just went under, or a, a son in jail. This time you're very concerned because you have never needed this much water from the hose. And you, you, honestly, you doubt the hose could possibly provide as much water as you need. And, and so you turn on the spigot and the water starts coming out once again. And, and it keeps coming and it keeps coming. And hours later, your tank does not need one more drop. And the hose won't give one more drop. Well, this time, before you leave, your curiosity gets the best of you. You, you realize you've never thought about, about it before, but what's on the other side of that wall? Where is this water coming from? What's on the other side of that wall? You now need to know. You, you can't leave until you discover what is the source of this water. Where exactly does this hose lead? Well, the wall is very high, and, and it seems to go endlessly in both directions. And so you realize you can't get over it, and you can't go around it. And, and as you start to feel the wall, a rock comes loose. And, and so you reach again, and two more stones roll out and land in the dirt. And, and it looks like you may be able to get through the wall, and so you begin removing stones. As you make progress, you, you begin to hear this strange heavy, almost rhythmic sound coming from the other side of the wall. And, and so now you're excited. You, you redouble your efforts of removing these stones. Eventually, a tiny patch of blue breaks through the gray stone, and you know that you're close. Soon, uh, you have a small hole big enough to look through, and what you see, as far as your eye can see, is the deep blue ocean. The waves are, are roaring against the wall that you've been seeing from the other side. And, and what you realize in that moment is despite the doubts and fears that you had each time, there has always been enough water. To the level of your weakness, the level of your need, of your acknowledgement, determines the amount of grace and strength that you will receive from God. And so... Don't bring a cup. Don't bring, like, back the truck up. Right? Don't show up with a cup. You back the truck up. Because when you don't have what it takes, man, he has everything you need. And every time you find yourself weak, you will discover that he is 
strong. His grace is greater than. We're going to give you a, a chance uh, to think about this and to, to, I hope, turn all of your attention to God. But maybe in these next few moment, moments, you could bring your weakness to Him and ask Him for strength in your weakness. Perhaps uh, you could realize and acknowledge that you have been begging Him and begging Him to change your circumstances and you haven't been listening for him because what he's been saying is that his grace is sufficient. During this time, as we give you some time to process this, to pray, our band's going to play one more song, and we will also have communion available if you'd like to take it. A communion is a chance for us to remember that God's strength was displayed in seeming weakness when Jesus died on the cross for us. He died so that our weakness when it comes to uh, temptation and sin could be more than made up for by the strength and the, the moral purity of Jesus. That's what his death does for us on the cross. So if you'd like to take communion, it's available on the um, candlelit tables around the room, and you can get the bread and juice, bring it back to your seat when you're ready to, to take that, to remember and thank him and recommit your, yourself and your life to him. You, you can do that. All right, so I'm going to pray, and then we'll give you a couple minutes to pray. God, I think our problem is that we are human, and it is just a very human response to weakness um, to beg for it to be taken away. When our circumstances don't fit our desires, we, just like Paul, we say, God, take this away, change my life, change my circumstances. When we feel temptation, God, I don't want to ever experience temptation again. And we have a God who loves us more than we love ourselves. God, you love us so much, and you say to us, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Let your weakness turn your attention to me. Look not to your own willpower, but to my strength. And we discover that your grace is always greater. God, I, I pray that um, we would learn today to embrace the shake, that, that if we want to become limitless, we need to, to embrace our limitations, and, and that this would not just be another day when we came to church, but today would be a day where we make a decision, you know, from now on, when I feel weak, when I don't have what it takes, I'm going to turn to God, experience his strength, because he has everything I need.